Hello, Music Appreciation Crew. This is Mr. Kimball. Um, so I've got our first presentation here. I'm trying to set this up basically like we do it in class, but I promise to make it go much quicker and uh, hopefully get you guys out of here and back to your normal day uh, in about 10 minutes. So uh, our first presentation here is on the end of the Baroque era, beginning of the classical era here with Franz Joseph Haydn. Uh, Haydn as a composer wrote 107 symphonies, 83 string quartets, 45 piano trios, 62 piano sonatas, and 14 masses as well as 26 operas. So you can tell that he... Uh, he wrote quite a number of works that, that were pretty well renowned. Um, additionally, just to give you a context here, now this was significantly later, but Beethoven only wrote nine symphonies. All right, Beethoven wrote nine symphonies. Haydn wrote 107, as well as uh, you know a plethora of other stuff. So he uh, definitely got his work done for sure. As a child, he was the uh, son of a wheelwright and a local landowner's cook, so he, he pretty much came from poverty there. He had a very, very fine, clear, pristine voice, and he was invited at the age of five to enter the choir school of St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna, uh, which, you know, is in uh, Vienna, Italy, I think. Is that, is that right? Vienna, Italy? Is it Austria? Austria. All right. My wife says it's Austria, so... So we're gonna check. Hold on. We're gonna we're gonna Google it. I probably should know this because like every single Austria. great composer comes from Vienna. It's Austria. We Google has answered. It's the capital. It's a capital. Oh dang. So that hopefully, right. hopefully none of you have been to Austria. Anyways, uh, Haydn also had a very high treble tone, which means his voice was just really high pitch, and it lasted until he was uh, sixteen. Um, and uh, this lady. Uh, uttered this famous criticism on Haydn. Her name was Maria Teresa. She said that the boy doesn't sing, he crows. So very, very high-pitched voice, and he uh, apparently kind of squawked with it. Uh, Haydn left the children's choir in uh, a really, really memorable fashion. It's kind of how I dream about leaving every single place. He uh, snipped off the pigtail of one of his fellow choir boys and uh, was publicly caned. Uh, which just means he was he was hit with a cane, um, and that's how he left the children's choir. So he uh, definitely made a name for himself. In his early life, beyond you know the uh, the the young boy, he uh, made some music that became distinctive and boldly individual, and inspired a perform a form of heightened emotionalism known as Sturm und Drang, which means storm and stress. Uh, and he had a reputation that really spread throughout Austria, and. Uh, received a ton of commissions as you can tell by his his workload that, that we saw on that first slide um so he was commissioned quite a bit i think we talked about uh patrons and composers before we left and commissioning works Sturm und Drang is an interesting interesting i, I guess we would consider it a form or, or perhaps a mood of music uh hopefully you guys get a chance i, I might be able to find a, a link or two to send to you so you can listen to that um Prince Esterhazy was a was a patron of Haydn, and he was his employer since nineteen or seventeen sixty two. Excuse me, died in seventeen ninety. He was replaced with an indifferent new crown prince. His name was Anton. With that in mind, uh, Haydn decided to move to Vienna and eventually visited England, where he found himself really, really adored in the seventeen ninety one seventeen ninety two time span. Just uh, everybody loved him. Moving on, uh, Prince Anton, which once again was the uh, the guy that was kind of indifferent about Haydn, didn't really care too much about him. He dies in 1795, and then his successor, Nicholas II, requested uh, that Haydn return to Esterhaza, and Nicholas set Haydn the task of composing a new setting of a mass every single year. So Haydn basically had a job for as long as this guy was alive composing a new mass. Haydn retired from Esterhaza, and uh, an illness prevented him from being from any farther compositions. So uh, the last few years of his life, he uh, didn't really compose much because he was so ill. During May of 1809, Napoleon reached Vienna. Hopefully you guys are learning about Napoleon or, or maybe you already have in some of your world history courses. But uh, Haydn stayed uh, right there, guarded respectfully by two of the invader sentries. So that, that's a pretty, pretty neat thing there. So Napoleon reaches Vienna, kind of takes over, and uh, puts his own guards to guard Haydn uh, just because that's how well respected he was around the world. On May 31st, 1809, Haydn uh, died peacefully in his sleep. 
So then some fun facts. Uh, this guy is a a really funny guy, a really funny composer. He was suggested it was suggested by the choir ma- oh, sorry, it was suggested by the choir master at St. Stephen's Cathedral to hide and undergo a certain operation to prevent his voice from breaking. Fortunately though, his father stopped the procedure from happening. For those of you that don't know, this operation is essentially a, a castration. It's it's making sure that Haydn does not go through puberty so that way his voice doesn't drop and uh and yeah it's uh pretty gruesome so they wanted to maintain that really clear pretty high voice but his father stepped in and said no 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 um and then Haydn progressed on through uh adolescence the premiere of Haydn symphony number 96 was notable not only because it was another great Haydn symphony but because a huge chandelier fell from the ceiling during the uh, debut performance of it uh, with that in mind, the symphony got its nickname, the Miracle Symphony, because somehow, even though that chandelier fell, there was absolutely no one injured. So that's why we call Symphony Number no. 96 the Miracle Symphony. Finally, we have uh, Haydn suffered throughout his life from what we call nasal polyps, which meant that his nose had a really bulbous and disfigured look to it. I, I encourage you guys to go look up a few pictures of Haydn, and you can kind of see this. He would typically also begin all of his scores with a dedication to God, using phrases uh, in Latin such as in nome domini, uh, which means in the name of the Lord. Haydn's sense of humor also made its way into many of his pieces. His string quartet in E-flat is called The Joke, and it includes false endings to try and catch the audience out. So basically, I don't know if you guys have ever had this before, but essentially it'd be like uh, at the end of a concert, you know how when the composer, or not the composer, sorry, the conductor cuts off a, a piece and there's a moment of silence and you start hearing some people clap, but then the conductor starts again and they keep playing. So it really wasn't the end. They just kind of, you just kind of thought it was the end. Haydn composed pieces to intentionally do this. So that way it would be like a joke on the audience. Like, ha, you thought it was over, but it's not. And then they keep going. Um, so that was just one example. I'm actually going to play a, a symphony for you called the Surprise Symphony, which was intended to lull people to sleep. It was so boring, but then all of a sudden it would just be this insanely loud and, and massive section where like every instrument's playing to wake you back up. So it kind of lulls you to sleep, lulls you to sleep, lulls you to sleep, and then bam, you're awake. Moving on to the fourth bullet point there, Haydn was close friends with Mozart and considered him to be the better composer of, of the two, so he thought he was better than himself. He mentored Mozart for some time while in Vienna, and Mozart's Requiem Mass was actually played at Haydn's funeral. So we're going to kind of see here a, a connection between Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven that sort of links our way into the the you know uh, really heart of the classical era. Haydn was a mentor to Beethoven. Uh, he was a close friend to Mozart, but a mentor to Beethoven. In his teens, Beethoven went to Vienna to play for Mozart and later on studied with Haydn. So you can kind of see Beethoven as the, the youngest guy there. Um, so I'm going to play, if I can find it here. Yeah, so this is the, uh, the Surprise Symphony. Um, I'll just play a little portion of this here.
Okay, guys, so hopefully you get a little bit of idea there of, of Haydn's sense of humor with those, you know, sort of humorous, drastic, uh, dynamic changes. So that was, once again, the Surprise Symphony. Um, I have a link here that I'll, I'll send you over live grades as well. It's a really, really great TED Talk all about Haydn's sense of humor. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, you should definitely go check it out. Um, it's about 10 or 11 minutes, so it, it's uh, pretty informative. But like I said, a, a really, really great TED Talk that I uh, I I particularly enjoy. So if you have any questions for me, um, once again, I'm available over Zoom and I'm available over live grades and email. Just reach out, even if it's not necessarily about music. I'm here for you all and uh, I'm here to help you in this time of, you know, stress and, and anxiety and everything like that. So if you need somebody to talk to, just reach out and I, uh, I got your back. Anyways, I hope to see you guys soon and I will be sending out another lecture video on Monday. So be looking out for that. Okay, bye.